say, so I'm going to forget half of it. But uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks to the sponsors right here. Uh, if you haven't entered the raffle yet, there's a raffle out there. I think you can win a GoPro or a uh, Fitbit or both if it's your day. Um, there is a feedback form online. So uh, if you want to leave some feedback, go online. Uh, I think that's about it. So let me introduce our next speaker, Travis Smith. He's from Tripwire. And he's going to talk about sweet security. All right, Travis. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, so my name is Travis Smith. I'm from Tripwire. I'm on our security research team, although I'll be talking about stuff completely not related to Tripwire. Um, so I'm glad that they gave me time to do this today. Uh, so let's just jump right into it, because I think directly after me is lunch. So, so first up, why I uh, really got into the research around all of this. Um, the first step is uh, Tripwire was acquired by Belden about a year ago, a little over a year ago, maybe. Um, and so they are heavily in the industrial space. So they came to me and said, you know, what do what does Tripwire do um, that we can you know play into this market? Are the you know is it a good fit? Is it you know any additional stuff that we need to do? And so I'm like, all right, well let me look into it. Um, the other part was I went home and I'm you know I'm looking at all these things that are on my network and uh, you know are they safe? Are they secure? You know is my you know can I install antivirus on my toothbrush or you know, is my door lock uh, safe from shell shock, right? So these are all questions that I had when I'm looking around. Um, and, you know, when I started getting into it, I realized that, um, you know, there's so many things both that are parable to both the Internet uh, of Things world as well as the industrial world, uh, you know, the ICS versus IoT. Uh, and the big thing is, is that these are uh, either outdated systems, uh, you can't install patches, patches aren't available, you can't even install security tools most of the time. Um, and even if, None of those are the case, and they are up-to-date systems, and you can install patches, and you can install security products. Sometimes you can't, or you don't want to. Uh, you need uptime, or uh, you need to maintain operational stability in the environment, and you just don't want to take that risk, right? So really, this is all about uh, protecting the unpatchable, right? So that's across all these environments, uh, and that's really what I want to get into today. And that's where it got me into uh, network security monitoring. And, um, deploying a uh, bunch of security tools on a very small form factor uh, that can be used in either small environments like your home, uh, small business, or even you know potentially up into larger environments. Um, so what I wanted to do is install this on, like I said, a Raspberry Pi. I had one laying around. I had a Model B Plus, and I really didn't want to take it off my network at home, mainly because it was running what I, uh, so a software called Raspberry Pints, which is a digital tap list for my kegerator. And I just couldn't sacrifice the beer, right? So I bought a new one. Luckily, last year, um, it was, I guess two years ago now, the Model B, uh, 2 came out, which has you know, a lot better, more processor, more memory, uh, all that good stuff. Um, so there's really lightweight what you need. Uh, the, the motherboard, uh, which is the Raspberry Pi, 35 bucks, a case, uh, a power adapter, memory card, uh, 8 gigs is about all you need. Um, obviously, more is better, uh, as I'm going to get into later. Uh, all said and done, 50, 60 bucks, uh, and you're good to go as far as hardware-wise. From the, uh, the operating system standpoint, there's a couple different options, especially when you're looking at uh, Raspberry Pi devices. Um, so what I use is Raspbian, uh, which is a, a Debian uh, variant, uh, very similar to Debian if, you're, if you've ever used it before. Um, it's a simple install ready to go. Noobs is another option that's new out of the box software. It's essentially just an easy way to install the, the Raspbian, gives you a you know, guided tour, all that kind of good stuff. Really good for noobs, right? The other option is uh, Ubuntu Mate. Uh, I've never used this, but it is Ubuntu, so it's very Debian-ish like. Uh, you could probably use it. Um, and another interesting one that I would like to play with eventually, but definitely out of the scope of this project, is Windows 10, right? No way, don't use it. Um, not because it's Windows, I mean, I don't have anything against Windows, but a lot of the tools I'll be discussing today are uh, Linux-only uh, pieces of software, so you don't want to don't use it. But if you are going to use it, go ahead. So, uh, getting into it. So the protection that I wanted to do um, is network security monitoring. The tool I used is Bro IDS. There's a couple options, and I'll get into that. But when you're looking at these types of environments and the attacks that are going against them, they're all, for the most part, going to be network-based attacks, right? So the attacker needs to, you know, exploit you across the network. Um, obviously, there are cases where they'd be not on the network. Uh, and then if they are going to actually uh, exfiltrate data off of you, right, they're going to probably get that across the network. So there's, you know, data going ac uh, across the wire that we can monitor. So we can do packet captures and just monitor all these packet captures and look at them like we're looking at right here, but nobody wants to look at packet captures all day and, and monitor them. So that's why I like Bro IDS. What it does is it sucks in the data. It's a, an NSM, IDS, IBS, IPS, whatever you want to call it. 
uh, and does uh, a full OSI layer inspection of all the traffic that goes across. So it does typical IDS stuff, you know, looking for known exploits, uh, pulls out the relevant metadata from all of the packets. So you get things like your uh, DHCP traffic and HTTP traffic, SSH, SSL traffic. So it can pull out uh, certificates if, you know, it is actually in line and can do that type of stuff. Uh, and then especially around the ICS and uh, environments, it does DNP3 and Modbus. Um, supports a little bit uh, lagging in those uh, if you are from an ICS type environment, but it is an option that's there. And it does allow you to write your own rules for it. So what they call bro code, you can be a programmer uh, and write your own rules for it. Um, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But so there's things, uh, the bottom two that I've listed there that you're in bold, kind of see that. The uh, Intel and the notice log, that's where all of the uh, you know, custom stuff that we're going to be looking at, um, some cool uh, data that's in there. Um, so when you want to install it, obviously there's just a few dependencies you want to install. Um, you just uh, download the source, you configure it, uh, you can put it in any, any directory you want, and you do, oh, I missed that one. Um, you do a make, and you just wait, and wait, and wait, and wait. <laughs> so the, on the model B, so the older one, it took three hours for me to build this uh, software. Uh, the newer one is about 45 minutes, um, so if you do this, go out, have some lunch, have a beer, have coffee, uh, and come back and then, you know, wait a little bit longer. And then do the make install and you're good to go. Um, so once it's installed, obviously we need to monitor the traffic, right? So the Raspberry Pi ships with just one physical uh, network card, uh, hardwired car, uh, card. So there's a couple different ways we can do it. The first is set it up as a gateway. Um, the advantage there is you don't need to buy any additional hardware. Uh, very simple to do, just some uh, configuration in the Raspberry Pi. Um, the downsides is one that it's not directly in line with your traffic, so uh, attackers can potentially bypass it if they know it's there. Um, they could just use the real gateway and void yours altogether. Um, the other is there's possible performance implications about uh, using this in line, right? So it's a Raspberry Pi, it's small, it doesn't have a lot of processor power behind it. Uh, I did run tests on my network uh, at home because I do have all this set up at my house. Um, I did speed tests, uh, didn't notice any difference uh, before or after I have this in. But if you're doing, you know, a lot of Netflix and a lot of downloading and a lot of streaming, uh, that might be an issue. Uh, the other option is a, a span or a mirror port, right? So if you have this at your home, uh, you probably don't. Um, again, no additional hardware needed. Um, the attackers can't bypass it if you have it all set up correctly, right? Because all of the traffic would be going out the span port. Um, and the Raspberry Pi isn't in line. So if you do have performance implications, uh, that's not going to happen. The downside, right, if we're, you know, we're talking about us at home using it, uh, your network uh, router probably doesn't have that feature enabled. Um, maybe it does. Then the final one is to set it up in line, right? The main downside is you have to buy an additional network adapter for it, right, because it comes shipped with one. Uh, does have four USB ports, so you do have that option. Uh, again, the same performance possibility implications with it, um, and that's about it. So we have our, our, our device set up, we have Bro installed, um, and there's a really cool feature, a uh, service that's available that we can do threat intelligence for free, right? So that's from uh, Liam Randall and his uh, critical stack company. And they provide a service that is this point and click integration with threat intelligence. So you uh, sign up and it's all free. Um, you go to their website, I think it's intel.criticalstack.com and uh, just choose which integrations you want. So you can pull down things like uh, Tor exit node IP addresses, known command and control servers, uh, known phishing uh, addresses, known phishing emails, uh, known, there's, there's a ton of them. Uh, and then you just install your agent alongside of it and you're good to go. So what does that look like? So we just have an agent, you install it. Uh, the agent knows, you just give it your API key. Um, it goes, it pulls from over a hundred different threat feeds that are available and they have well over a million different uh, indicators of compromise that are in your environment. And it converts the, all of that into actual, the bro code that gets injected directly into bro itself. So very easy to get set up and, and be able to monitor any traffic on your environment. All right, very easy to do uh, as of mid last year. So I work very closely with them uh, because they did not have a ARM based agent for it. And that's a lot of problems with installing some of these security tools on the Raspberry Pis, they're all ARM based. Um, so they did uh, release a ARM-based version for me. Uh, it's on their website. You just install it, give it the API key that you get when you install and you're up and running. It does everything automatically in the background. So highly recommend checking out that service. Uh, so 
now that we have all of that data there, uh, we need to do something with it. So what I like to use is a service called Logstash. Uh, Logstash is an open source log management product that's from the Elastico. Um, so um, it's part of what we call the Elk stack, uh, being E is Elasticsearch, L is Logstash, and K is Kibana. Uh, and we're going to use all three of those today. So the first one is Logstash. Uh, so I'm a very high level architectural uh, viewpoint. It's uh, very complicated and crazy, right? So you take a data input, you do something with it on the filter plugin, and then you send it somewhere, right? Very novel concept. So let's dig in and see kind of what that looks like, you know, under the hood. So the three levels, we have inputs, filters, and outputs. So the in inputs we have, I think now there's over, well over 40 different types of inputs. So if you're on the Raspberry Pi, you could do things like local files, uh, set up a syslog collector if you do have other network devices uh, you want to bring it into. Uh, standard in if you want to just, if you're debugging and, and troubleshooting and want to play around with it over the command line. Um, so it takes all that data in, then it sends it to its filter plugin. Uh, there's a ton of different uh, plugins here. But the ones that we're going to be using today are Grok. Uh, Grok is going to be normalizing our messages. So pulling out the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, uh, all of those out of the message. Uh, and then when we get things out of there, we can add it to some of the other plugins. So we're going to do some GOIP stuff, uh, some translation, which is really cool, uh, and some of the date filtering stuff uh, that might not seem apparent if you were going to set this up yourself. Uh, then you can send it out somewhere. So Elasticsearch is really what it's built for, uh, but it can do so much more, right? So if you can set it up as a syslog forwarder to just fill, uh, uh, forward on the relevant information that you care about. Um, I have it set up to send me email alerts for some specific things, and I'll show you in a second. Uh, Standard Out does other relational databases, PagerDuty, if you're using that kind of thing. Uh, so a lot of different uh, integration points for Logstash. Um, so it's not a just one-to-one uh, -one, uh, translation of what the filters. We can use as many as we want, so we can do you know, multiple different uh, inputs, multiple different filters, multiple different outputs, doesn't matter. Uh, handles it all really well. So here's what we're going to do. Like I said, we're going to um, utilize some custom patterns, and that's really the normalization engine of uh, what it's uh, pulling the relevant metadata out of the logs that we're looking at. Uh, the grokking is the actual normalization of that. We're going to have some custom fields uh, that can uh, give us some more context around the data, uh, GYP some stuff, and then do some date matching and translations for some additional threat intelligence. So the first step is installing the database. So Elasticsearch is the database, very easy to install. It's just a Debian package, download it, install it. Uh, they had their uh, Elastico conference last week, and now they're on version 2.2. So I thank them for uh, giving me a new version before my talk today. Um, but the previous versions, you had to configure a cluster name in the uh, Elasticsearch YAML file, uh, which is just in the Etsy directory. Uh, I don't believe you need to do that in version 2.2. Um, but if it's there, you might want to change it. Otherwise, uh, by default, it will go through and uh, connect to other ones if there's no security in place. So I did some you know, setup on my network at, at work uh, and was wondering why my brand new Elasticsearch instance had a ton of data in it. And it's just because they started talking to each other and I didn't set up any security. Um, the second component is Logstash. Uh, again, very easy. Just download the, the data, uh, unzip it. And you can uh, just see here is a sample configuration looking at just one standard in, one standard out. Problem is, is that there's uh, no FFI available uh, for the ARM instance. So we need to get around that to begin with. So we do that. We need uh, ant to build it. Uh, so you need to first get ant. You need to get the uh, FFI um, from GitHub, links here. Um, go in there, build it, um, and then copy the code to Logstash. And from there, package it all up together, rerun the command, and you're good to go, right? So just one little small, uh, small little detail that you need to watch out for if you're going to install Logstash on your Elasticsearch cluster. Final one is Kibana. So Kibana is our visualization engine for uh, the Elk stack. Um, just download it, unzip it, run it, and you have another error. So we need another, uh, uh, the, the Node.js for uh, the ARM. So just download it, repackage it, put it into your Kibana directory, and you are good to go. So when that's all done, set and go, we have a nice pretty uh, elastic search that we can start doing stuff with. Now the next step would be is we can just dump a, dump a ton of data in there and we can do index searching and things like that, but we want to add some metadata and, and actually normalize the messages. So here's a uh, very simple command, uh, sorry, logstash configuration file. So logstash is controlled by a set of either one or many configuration files. Uh, so these can put, you can put all of these in one directory, and it will just uh, suck them in and uh, 
add them in alphabetical order, right? So you can have what I do uh, when I have a, a highly complex uh, logstash configuration is I just put my input uh, in one configuration file and I just have zero underscore input, uh, my output as nine underscore output, and then I do all of my filtering in, <coughs> excuse me, anywhere between two and eight. So here we're just looking at a uh, all of the logs in the uh, logstash directory. So that would be, you know, star.logs, it does support asterisks. Uh, and then outputting them to Elasticsearch. And again, we have our cluster name down there if that is necessary for our environment. So here's a, a sample uh, normalization for an Apache uh, access log. So this is just taking in the message, right? So that's here on the left and uh, trying to normalize it in this. So it's taking something that looks like an IP and putting it into the client column and then taking something that looks like a word, putting it to the method column, so on and so forth. And if it all matches, then it's gonna pass it off to the output and the output's gonna put it wherever it needs to go. Um, not entirely useful when we're looking at bro data. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna put all of our normalization stuff in its own custom directory. So we're gonna create a, a folder called custom patterns uh, and then put all of our stuff in there. So the configuration files I have is I have the full um, log normalization message, uh, one per line, and then I give it a uh, what I call a rule ID. So in this case, uh, I'm gonna have a rule ID called 291009 uh, and put my bro code in there. Not bro code, normalization. So here's what that looks like, right? So I have a, a rule called bro.rule, uh, and it, you know, concatenates this here, but this would all be one line saying 291009 space, and then all of my message here. Uh, so this is pulling out things like start time, UID, source IPs, destination IPs, ports, description, scene, where. Uh, so this is gonna really depend on really what you're normalizing. So if this is bro, uh, it's all comma separated, so it's pretty relatively straightforward to normalize. Uh, if you get into some more complex uh, Log formats, this can get a little bit tricky, um, but here's an example of, of what it is. And I have all this stuff available, and I'll give you a link in a minute. Um, so now that it's in there, what I do is I wrap all of my uh, configuration in if, uh, if else conditional statements. So what I have here is a conditional statement saying, if the message looks like my huge long regex, then go through and do my uh, grokking. Um, if this looks confusing and you don't know how this would work, it's actually relatively simple. So on the bottom down here, we have the, the rule message. Can you see that? Okay. And all I have to do is just take off the rule ID and then uh, remove all of the capture groups and then just put the regex up top. So relatively simple. Uh, you could do this with some scripting and it'll do all of your code uh, very simple for you. Um, so now that we're here, uh, the reason that we do these if conditional statements is to do the uh, use the add field functionality. And there's a few reasons why I like to do this. Um, one is I can add additional context around my messages. So he, right here I'm adding uh, device type, action, object, and status. So these are the uh, CEE common event, event enumeration. I think that's right. The stuff originally done by MITRE. Uh, things like uh, you know what a login or a log on or authenticated might be. You can normalize it into one action. Same thing around status. Um, it's kind of the core of what a log management product would do. Uh, and the second component is doing the rule ID. And the reason I do this is I can uh, make Logstash be more performant for me. So it's a top-down normalization engine. So it's going to match every single message from the top down until it finds a match. So by doing adding a rule ID to all of these messages. Uh, I can continually run a query against my Elasticsearch database and see what the most commonly used uh, normalization uh, rules are and bubble those up to the top of my configuration engine so it doesn't have to do the uh, you know, computationally expensive uh, regular expression across all of my logs. So it makes for a happier log stash. Um, so if we are doing IP addresses, um, the GIP function in the log stash is really nice. Uh, it allows you to just uh, look up a, a GeoLite City database uh, that would be local on the, uh, you know, on our Raspberry Pi in this case, and provide a set of coordinates to it. So here I'm looking up a destination IP address, uh, and if I find a match in my database, it's going to add all of these fields, so longitude, latitude, city, continent, country, postal code, uh, to a GeoIP destination um, target. And so that would be another field in my uh, Elasticsearch database. Um, so Logstash does ship with one um, GIP uh, field that you can use, and I think it's just called GIP. So if you have multiple ones, which most often, more often than not, you will have, right? So we're gonna have source IPs or destination IPs, proxy IPs. Uh, you're gonna wanna update your cluster. So we need to add a new template to the uh, Elasticsearch uh, database to figure that out. So the way we do that, 
it's small. Um, so there's a curl command that we can just actually get our template, and here's what it outputs. Um, so I have to do is just remove some of the key fields. So uh, just remove the name logstash, the order. Uh, so if, on the left, you can see there's the GUIP cluster. On the right, I changed that to GUIP underscore DST for my destination GUIP. Uh, so we can add as many of these as we'd like. So we can do things like GUIP source or GUIP proxy. Uh, any, you, know, you can do as many as you like, and then just push it back there. So then that's just another uh, curl exput command, and you just, just do dash D and then add that uh, huge long string there. So pretty straightforward and easy to do. Um, then the final one is something that might not really seem relevant when you're starting this up on yourself, uh, and that's doing the date matching functionality. So if you're collecting data in real time, this is an issue, right? So in a logging uh, perspective, we have two times. We always have collect time and we always have uh, event time, right? So there's usually other, but those are the two main ones we always look at when we're talking about logs. So if you're collecting in real time, the collect time is usually the event time. Uh, there are cases when the collect time is not the event time. Uh, maybe you're doing batch collection of files, the file is only collecting every five minutes. Um, or in the case of Bro, what's really nice about Bro is that you can feed it packet capture data. So if you have an event that you are uh, curious about and you pack, uh, do the packet capture off, and then you can take those PCAPs offline and feed them into Bro, right? So without this date matching, you would just get a huge spike of data as, as soon as you input the data. Um, but if you do this, you can uh, then match the time that's from the packet capture and then you get a nice histogram uh, in the Elasticsearch and gives you con uh, time context around there. Uh, so nice little uh, gotcha if you're doing any forensics data. And then the last one is the uh, translate plugin. So this is the really fun plugin for me. Um, so what I do is a translation of a field that I'm normalizing. So in this case, I'm normalizing a destination IP field and then looking up whatever I find there in a, uh, a YAML file. So I have a, a right here, I have an IP.yaml file and I feed this with malicious IP addresses. So if I see IP address 1.1.1.1 in de destination IP and I do see it in the IP.yaml file, I can then put a, a value inside the malicious IP field. So what I do is I just put the, f the word yes in there. So I can then do later queries to say, is malicious IP equal yes? Um, and if that is the case, then I know I have some type of uh, security event that I want to take a look at. So what goes in there, what does it look like? This is a dictionary hash, um, so just some value colon another value. Uh, so uh, IP addresses uh, and file hashes, uh, so IP addresses, file hashes, uh, websites, email addresses, so those are the four that I primarily use, and then just put the word yes next to it, and then I just put it into a malicious something field. Um, so that's a, uh, what Elastico calls a community maintained plugin, so it doesn't install by default, so we can just do a quick install of it and it will uh, install for us. And then here's this kind of example of what it looks like uh, and a couple different uh, external sources that I use. Uh, so one is a uh, from Tor Project, that is just a list of Tor IP addresses. Uh, another one is a list of malicious, uh, known malicious IP addresses. Uh, and we can just uh, scrape that website, pull down the list, format it into our YAML file, uh, and we're good to go. So Logstash will um, re-ingest that, that YAML file every 300 seconds, every five minutes. Uh, so if we can, you know, if we populate it more often than that, we can set a parameter to shorten that, or if you don't, you know, if you do it less, you can make it longer, um, you'd be good to go. So going back to here, so I, I populated this on a virtual machine on my desktop and I had about roughly a million uh, IOCs between IP addresses and uh, file hashes and that's when Logstash completely uh, fell over. Uh, but I didn't have, I didn't tune it, I didn't, you know, mess with the JVM at all, so it is possible if you have a lot more than that, if you're doing a massive IOC database, that you can tune the JVM or add more memory or add more processes, things like that. Um, but on a Raspberry Pi, um, I probably wouldn't recommend putting a thousand or a million uh, IOCs in there. So one of the reasons why I do this, one is I can search for it later, uh, another is I can get notified. So I'm uh, using here the email uh, output plugin. So not only is it outputting it to my Elasticsearch cluster, uh, I'm also getting notified. So anytime at my home, I typically don't do a lot of Tor networking at my house. If uh, any of my devices are connecting to a Tor network, uh, I can get an email automatically, right? So we can do things like known Tor IP, ad Tor IP addresses, malicious IP addresses, uh, any file hashes, um, and then just get a very quick email notification so you can uh, kick off your uh, thing. So on the bottom, we see here HTML body. That's not a variable. Uh, what that looks like is something like this. Uh, very simple, it can do HTML or just uh, raw text. Uh, just set it up, good to go. Uh, gives me the information that I need uh, immediately and we're good to go. So here's the, uh, the email alerts that I do set up uh, automatically. So like I said, Tor IP addresses, malicious IP addresses, uh, malicious file hashes, so those are all things that are coming from my YAML files that I'm doing through the translations. 
the Intel and the notice logs from Bro, those are the things that are primarily fed by Critical Stack. Uh, so if Critical Stack is telling me that something is bad, I want to pay attention to that. Uh, I also uh, do some GYP uh, emails there, so things coming you know, to or from China or Russia. I don't generally don't do a lot of uh, browsing of those services, but um, obviously attribution is as easy as an IP address now, so we can do that. Uh, and then some device specific uh, whitelisting. So I did a, I put all my machines in learn only mode and I just monitored the traffic for a few weeks uh, and looked at what everything was communicating to. So my, you know, my fridge or my TV or my thermostat um, generally only communicate to a very small handful of IP addresses. Um, so if, you know, that's usually for updates or for uh, control of the device, you know, for while I'm out and about they typically don't change those IP addresses very often. So if something is outside the norm of those, I can set up alerts to see if, you know, something, uh, you know, fishy is going on. So here is what we're, we, we end up with. So here's the Kibana dashboard from the bro data uh, fed with years and years and years of malicious PCAP data. So we can see interesting things like spikes in the histogram on the top, um, pie charts, which everybody loves. Uh, it gives you some pretty cool context. Uh, what I really love about the Kibana interface is that it's uh, very interactive and you can zoom in and out of the database to give you context. So uh, if you, so on the left here I have the destination IP addresses or source IP addresses. So these could be things like your internal devices uh, and you know, maybe you can click on, you know, the green one here, that might be your, you know, your Xbox or whatever, right? And you can click on that and then it'll reframe the entire dashboard in the, in the context of just that, what you just clicked on. Um, so it gives you the ability to zoom in or out and, and kind of see what's going on. Uh, here is a, uh, a feed of that same set of data, except with the context, instead of show me all the data, it's just saying, show me everything that I know is malicious. So this is everything that went through my thread intel feeds uh, and got tagged as yes, as malicious. Um, so I can do things like my GOIP map, the uh, IP addresses, see where they're at, um, see if they're coming you know, from uh, nefarious places online, uh, see which of my devices may be communicating there, uh, and you know, potentially address that type of uh, information. Um, then again, just a, a bigger GOIP map um, gives you a little bit of information on what you are seeing on your network. So that's a lot of text and a lot of configuration. It might be well above your head. It might be so easy to you. You're like, I don't even want to do it. Uh, I put all of the scripting on there uh, on my GitHub page. So if you can go here, I have scripts that will, all you have to do is just give it your critical stack API key and it'll install uh, bro, critical stack, uh, Elasticsearch, logs dash, Kibana, and configure them all for you. Uh, it might take a little while, but it will do it all for you. Um, so I uh, recommend doing that if you're interested in setting up this environment. So here's what our environment looks like. So we have our devices on the right, um, thing, you know, all of our IoT devices, or this could be industrial devices or your enterprise network, uh, going through Bro and uh, out to the internet. So Bro is fed by Critical Stack, which is fed by other third-party sources, things like Fish Tank, Open Fish, uh, Malcode. You know, they have a ton of different uh, ingest points. Uh, output to Logstash, and then we can set up our reporting uh, workflow off of that. Things like uh, just you know, output it directly to our Elasticsearch, or actually set up alerts to our email, phone, pager duty, uh, and actually let us control our environment better than we could have before. All right, but that's not enough, right? I had to put a picture of uh, Leonardo DiCaprio since he won last night. Um, so th there's more that we can do here, right? So this is very defensive, and you know what's happening to me. Uh, what you know, but you know, obviously we like to do a little bit more, and we might want to get a little bit more offensive on it. All right, so we can do things like set up uh, our Raspberry Pi to do network scanning. So I can just do very quick Nmap scans across my entire network uh, and see new things are, that are going on there. So what mine is doing is just every minute it's just doing a ping scan, seeing what's on there. And if anything is new, it adds it to a SQLite database uh, that I can use and interact with later. Um, but then it just also emails me saying something is coming up here. Uh, I kind of live in the country, so this isn't a big deal for me. But when I lived, you know, here in San Francisco years ago, and I lived in a very popular, uh, po uh, populated apartment complex, this is something I was very worried about: is somebody getting onto my network and, and, you know, stealing my data, right, or at least my bandwidth. So again, on the uh, the sweet security page on my GitHub page, I have all of the uh, ability to set up the Nmap scan and do all of that. Um, so when I see new devices, I can ingest it directly into OpenVos, which also runs on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so we can just install the dependencies, uh, get up and running, so the, the libraries, the scanner, the manager, uh, CLI stuff we'll need so we can interact with it programmatically, uh, as well as Greenbone, so we can, I like, I'm a, I'm a visual person, so I like the, uh, you know, the actual GUI. Uh, it's not that difficult to do, but there's scripts on, on the uh, Sweet Security GitHub page if you want to install that as well. Uh, 
one thing to note, it's, it works, but it's very slow, even on the new one. Uh, it, uh, it takes a while to do a, a scan of my environment, so I think I have set up here, right? So what I do is I do a, a full and fast scan of my entire network, uh, or sorry, of any new devices, and it takes a while. Uh, it, it'll take, uh, on my network, well over an hour to finish any scans. So if you are setting this up, uh, I would recommend probably deploying two Raspberry Pis. Uh, do one for the, the Bro IDS stuff and another one for uh, some more offensive stuff. Uh, and we'll be uh, probably a little bit more performant. Um, so when I see new devices, I just get a quick email alert. Um, that's you know, some just simple SMTB email alerting in the, uh, the Python scripts I have on there. So there are some commercial options available that do a lot of the same things, uh, minus you know some actual vulnerability scanning and things like that. Trend Micro has some medieval-looking uh, routers um, that will do uh, what we call AI protection, at least what they call AI protection, which is a web service from Trend Micro. So that just does something very simple, like um, I visit a website, talks to their website, is this, you know their service is the service safe? Yes, it is. You can go. You know, on the other side, is this service safe? You know, no, it's not. It's dangerous. Don't do that. Uh, and they'll block it, right? So they do, you know, a huge list of things um, that they're, you know, looking for in their service. Um, they also have what they call auto patching, which is interesting. Um, so somebody attacks you, um, they say, you know, over the network, and they the router patches all vulnerabilities, which is amazing that they can patch a vulnerability over the network, right? <laughs> uh, what they're just doing is deep packet inspection. So they're just doing NSM, right? So it's just an IDS service that they have there, but um, the marketing people like to have fun, I guess. Um, so there are, here's the devices that you can install that on. Uh, a bunch of the RTACs, they are quite expensive unless you get down to the 56U, which doesn't really do a lot. Um, so I mean, if you're looking at three, four hundred dollars to deploy one of these, um, and you could do security for 65, uh, it's a little bit more um, financially better, at least for me it was. Um, so there's some future work that goes here. Um, number one is uh, Raspberry Pi released the Model 3 today, um, which is great timing. So that one's going to have a 64-bit processor. Uh, it's 10 times more uh, performant, I believe they said. It also includes built-in Wi-Fi, so now you can have two network cards on there built in. You don't need additional pieces. Um, so since it is 64-bit, I think they still don't release a 64-bit OS. I think they're still relying on a 32-bit. Uh, so all of the code should still work there just fine. Um, if once they go to 64, there might be issues, but we'll let future us figure that out. Um, so I am looking into how I can integrate this with some of my third-party firewalls. So if I can uh, communicate with my actual firewall on my home network and say I'm seeing these types of threat intel, um, you know, and be proactive about it. So if I know that this is malicious IP is is bad, don't tell me that I went to it. You know, just block it for me. Um, and I, you know, it's potential we can do that with IP tables on the uh, Raspberry Pi itself uh, if it you know is in line instead of a span mirror port and just block the communication at that point. Um, so it's interesting to go a little bit less proactive and, or a little less reactive and more proactive. Other way around. Um, the other one is Security Onion. So Security Onion has a ton of cool tools um, that I haven't really had a chance to play around with on the, the you know the ARM architecture of the Raspberry Pi. So I'm not even sure if they will install. Uh, so I'd be curious to know if anybody of you guys have, has done any of that. Uh, so they do a lot of the same things like you know Bro and um, some of these other things. They also do Snort. Uh, I chose to go Bro over Snort uh, for performance reasons. When Snort was installed on the Raspberry Pi, it just completely knocked it over. I couldn't do anything on the uh, the Raspberry Pi after that. Uh, so Bro is a little bit more performant. Um, and then the Kali Linux also installs on Raspberry Pis, which is interesting uh, and fun at the same time. So they do have an image available that you can download, install, and deploy on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so we might be able to leverage that in the future and be a little bit more offensive uh, with our capabilities if somebody's coming onto our network. Um, yeah, so that's where, where we're at there. Um, so that's kind of what I had for you, and I just wanted to, you know, this isn't the end of the discussion. I really want to know kind of what you guys uh, think about you know, how this would deploy in your networks or uh, you know, future work that you might want to see around this environment. And, um, and that's what I have. So the floor is yours. Yeah, I think we have a question down here. I, I may have missed it, but I, wasn't, I didn't see how you were handling the, um, the problem of dots in bros. Uh, logs and Elasticsearch's failure to, to import those. Um, since Elasticsearch 2.0, I think it was, they don't, the dot, 2.2, .2, they don't, well, I guess since 2, they don't deal well with dots and field names. I missed how you were, was that in your normalization code that you were getting yeah. rid of those in Pro? Um, so I'm doing add field. Um, I haven't tested it on 2.2. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, 
All right, so his question is around uh, Elasticsearch 2.0 and their ability to um, use fields, right? Is that, is that yeah, field, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I, like I said, I haven't had a chance to play with 2.2. Um, you know, obviously they just released 2.2 last week. Uh, 2.0 I haven't had a chance to play with. Um, I, the stuff that I'm using isn't using the, you know, that, that type of functionality. It's using the, my own custom stuff that I define. So if, if there are issues with, you know, formatting and, and uh, issues like that, we could easily work around it. It's not that big of a deal. It's just configuration at that point. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's talk after if I can get the, that information. Okay, any more questions? Well, Travis, thanks for that. Uh, cool. That was a pretty sweet talk. <laughs> um, on behalf of, I don't know who, on behalf of me, here's a Fitbit. Hey, thank you. You can let us know if there's any malicious traffic uh, once you put that on your network. I will. So uh, if there's no more questions, thanks, Travis, once again yeah. for the talk. Let you guys get back to lunch.